Let's pray. In a very little while, all of us will be dead and standing face to face before the King, Jesus. There'll be no doubts anymore. And how I pray, Father, that you would use me in this moment and this church and these songs and your word to bring that certainty forward into this age lest we play games and then suddenly we're there. Oh God, I beg of you, forbid that any in the hearing of my voice would be unprepared to face Jesus. May we give ourselves 110% to knowing you so that we won't find you a stranger at that day. Grant that the drama of baptism appointed to display the glorious gospel will have its suitable effect. To that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A three-part series on baptism and church membership. We're tonight, today, on the second of those. Last time it was the importance of church membership. And in this message, the focus will be on what is Baptism and how important is it? I want to strike a note immediately, a tone, a, a truth. I want it to be first and foremost, namely that baptism gets its meaning and its importance from the death of Jesus Christ, the Son of God for our sins, and from his resurrection from the dead. We're not talking mainly here when we talk about baptism. We're not talking mainly about a religious ritual. We're not talking mainly about a church tradition. We're talking mainly about Christ. We're talking mainly about his death. We're talking mainly about his resurrection and how he has appointed that his life, his death, his resurrection be dramatized as people pass from death to life. Don't think small thoughts when you think about baptism. Think big thoughts when you think about baptism. Think huge thoughts when you think about what is being signified when a person is buried in water and comes up out of the water. This is not a game. This is not a charade. When a husband slides a wedding ring onto his wife's finger for the first time about... 30 seconds after they have become man and wife by virtue of covenant vows. It's not a small thing. You don't blow it off. You don't say this doesn't matter. Let's all laugh and be stupid here. Let's all count this silly. It's not silly. It's big. It's weighty. It carries huge things in it. That's the note I want to strike. The way we're going to approach this is by quoting from the Bethlehem Baptist Church Elder Affirmation of Faith so that you all can remember what it is that all the elders of this church, 35 of us, of which I'm one, believe and teach about baptism. You can't be an elder at this church if you don't believe this. Okay, I'll read it to you. 
And then we're going to unpack it biblically and spell out some implications. We believe that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord by which those who have repented and come to faith express their union with Christ in his death and resurrection by being immersed in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is a sign of belonging to the new people of God, the true Israel, and an emblem of burial and cleansing signifying death to the old life of unbelief and purification from the pollution of sin. So, I'm going to break that down into five pieces and put Bible underneath all of them because that's all that matters. What I think doesn't matter, what you think doesn't matter, what God thinks really matters, and He told us here. And so, you now assess whether as I try to put Bible under these pieces, whether I'm being faithful to the book. First, we say we believe that baptism is an ordinance of the Lord. What we mean by that is simply he commanded it, and he commanded it or ordained it, ordained ordinance, in such a way that it becomes an ongoing practice of the church. And we get that from Matthew 28, 19, and 20, which goes like this. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now the main verb in that sentence is make disciples. You got, it's all surrounded by participles, subordinate verbs. Having gone, make disciples, and then two defining participles, baptizing and teaching. So he unpacks the meaning of disciple-making with two participles, baptizing, teaching. So if you ask, what does it mean to make a disciple? One of the things it means is get them baptized. That's what he said. He said other things, but that he said. The time frame of validity for that command is dictated by the promise of his help to bring it about. And the promise goes like this, verse 20. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now that's the promise undergirding the command or the ordinance, go make disciples baptizing. So how long should we do this? Answer, as long as the promise holds it up to the end of the age. So till Jesus comes, our job as Christians is to so evangelize that people come to trust and be baptized. That's number one. Number two, baptism expresses union with Christ in his death and resurrection. We get this from Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. I'm just giving you the key verses, there are others, but we'll just go with the key ones. Romans 6, verses 3 and 4 goes like this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into, Jesus, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The wider context of Romans, that's Romans 6, the wider context of Romans would say that it would be a mistake if you concluded from this that water baptism is the instrument or the means by which we are united to Christ. In Romans, faith is the means by which we are united to Christ and justified. Therefore, having been justified by faith, 